is no better way to endear a speaker to the audience than to have him in a position of scrutinizing who's listening and who's not so you can win a prize. Uh, but I, I want to assure you of something with that is that I'm not going to do that because I am, I am genuinely on your side because of my relationship to Open Door, which has been spanning so many years. As, as Kenneth said, my family came here in 2002. Actually, my wife and I came here in 2002 for seminary. And I got here whew, green as green can be. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about anything. So many of the important things that Open Door had invested in our family, I came here with none of that. And so Open Door is not just a church to come do a session at. Open Door is really family for us and has made a huge, huge impact. And then all the way down to us, you know, planting our church uh, out of Open Door and, and there's just been nothing like it. So I am, I am one of you and I am on your side. I'm not going to scrutinize who's listening today. But what I wanted to do here at the beginning is just have a little table time. And just with those who are at your table, we want to spend a few minutes answering to each other this question. What is it about this weekend, this workshop on anxiety and fear, and the sense that we need to overcome it that appeals to you most? You know, that it may be that some people are here because you, know, you, you, you would come to anything. It doesn't really matter what it is or whether it's something you feel. Others of us really feel this need to, to change in this way. We're overwhelmed by anxiety or we have someone that we love. So you have some answers to those, those questions. And so share those with whoever else is at your table. And then we'll do that for a few minutes. And then I'm going to come back up and then we'll begin the session. And I'm actually going to ask for at least a couple of people to just kind of share some of the things that were mentioned at your table so we can get a sense of why each other are here. So take that time right now and kind of uh, answer that question together. Why are you here? What do you hope to get out of the weekend? And why does this really appeal to you? And then I'll bring us back together uh, with our attention up here on the platform. All right, well, let me gather our attention back here to the front as uh, we begin this first session together. And uh, let me go ahead and ask just if there are any kind of loud voices from some of the tables that would just kind of volunteer to our group. We're all going to kind of operate together as, a, as one big group. I know we're in tables, but just to share a couple answers of uh, why someone at your table is here, what you're hoping to get out of this weekend as you hear different uh, you know, seminars and breakout sessions. So who wants to just raise a hand and start sharing nice and loud? Come on. Yeah, that's right. Others. Bye. A little bit. Why not for work? Yeah. Anyone, what you hope to get out of the weekend? What you, you think this weekend may give you something that you can apply to your life or some way that you'd like to see something change? It could be a specific situation. It could be something general. Uh, 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 I appreciate that a lot. What you just will young lady that I see they were about coffee to both ways. Maybe one more. So. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think all of those answers really resonate with me. So I'm here and looking forward to this weekend. One, because I'm I'm delighted to be able to be a part of it in this way and uh, to share some things that have been helpful to me. But at the same time, I said it earlier, I am certainly one of you as well because I I told my wife just the other day that I really felt like this was the most stressful and anxious season of my life. And so I'm standing here quite anxious in this moment. And not just about this. I'm certainly anxious about this. I'm always anxious about this. But anxious about my life. Um, You know, our our oldest, Hannah, is now uh, 19 uh, at Boyce College, engaged. That's a big source of anxiety. We love the guy. He's a great guy. Everything, I mean, everything, it's great. But it's still a source of, you know, anxiety and concern for me. Our second daughter, Sophie's getting ready to go off to college in Virginia Beach. That's going to be a big transition in our home. She's a big help. She's a big, bright part, as all of our kids are, of just the personality of our home, the enjoyment of our family. And that's really a source for me. Uh, I love basketball. I always have loved basketball. I have now a almost 16-year-old son who is playing high school basketball, and it is tapping in to my idolatry like few other things because I want so bad for him to succeed. And I am, I am all in. In fact, this past season, so he had, if you know some things about basketball, especially, you know, being young and learning to play basketball, he's a great player, a starter on his freshman team, but through the season really struggled to score at the rim. Like he could get to the rim whenever he wanted to, but he, he started struggling. You know, sometimes it could get in your head and then, and then it can be really difficult and man, we just, we, we really, uh, that was such a source of anxiety for me because I just wanted him to succeed. I, I wanted to see him do well. I didn't want to see him discouraged. And, and I just found so many times that it was gripping my heart. So, so then one night, not even, a, not even a game that matters. It's not a turn, tournament game. It's not even, it's not even a conference game. It comes down to the very end of the game. And we are down one with about three seconds left. And we get the ball under our goal. And of course, I keep the books at the game because it keeps me from yelling. And my wife doesn't like me yelling at the games. And so I'm keeping the books and I'm really in tune with our team. Like I know the plays that we run. And so in that situation, I know what's getting ready to happen. Josiah's going to flash out to the top, put his hands up as though he's calling for the ball. And he's going to dive to the opposite block, get the, get the ball. There's only like, like just a couple of seconds left. Catch it. And I am, I'm at the table and I'm praying. I'm praying one to the Lord and I'm praying also to Josiah. And I'm saying, Lord, please, please let him make it. Please let him make it. Josiah, come on, man. Win the game. Win the game. I wanted that elation so bad for him. Flashes to the top, hands up, comes down to the block, gets the ball, turn, Great pump fake, plenty of time, rushes it, rolls off the rim. I went home and went down to my basement office and I wept for 45 minutes uncontrollably. Now, it's not just about basketball. It's about my life, you know? There are all of these things. I'm at a stage in my life at 46 where I'm in the middle. I'm I'm, I'm a little lost in the middle. I kind of feel like... I'm, I'm not exactly sure where things are going. I don't exactly know where I am. We've come out of church planting, big thing to accomplish. And now we're in the kind of plotting phase of the church. And that's new for me. And that's a source of anxiety for me. There are just so many different things that happen in our lives. So many. So I'm here with you, man. I need, I need to overcome anxiety and fear and I need help. So I'm happy to be here because the things that I want to share in the brief time that we have are things that have helped me and things that I need to help me. And so what we're going to do in the time that we have in this session is begin by kind of considering this struggle that we all have with anxiety and fear. Maybe if you think about it as a building, as three levels, and we'll start off with the top level, the third, the third level of the building, and then we're going to go down a couple floors as we drill kind of down into this issue. So what we want to do is we want to begin by kind of entering into our anxious reality. Just 
to get a better grip on what exactly do we mean when we say we're anxious? What do I mean when I say I'm afraid or when I have a, you know, a concern or I'm troubled? And then we can come down another level to try to understand this, this anxious world that we're living in and what is our place in it. And then finally, we'll make one last descent to the bottom floor when we want to try to bring some, we can't bring all of them, there are just too many, but to bring some answers from God's word, from Jesus, the living Savior who is with us, he is at work by his spirit, he has given us a sufficient word, and then perhaps we can come away with some answers, both answers that are theological, but also some answers that are practical, and see if this might help us just take a couple steps forward. You know, we're not under any delusion this weekend, over the next 40 minutes, that we're going to walk out of here cured of anxiety and fear. It's just not going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen in my, in my lifetime on earth. I just think that there, my remaining sin, my struggles, this world is going to be an ongoing, it's going to be an ongoing battle. But with some tools, the Lord will help us. And that really is our our desire. One thing is for sure. We are all anxious. The title of this first session you may notice is Be Anxious for Nothing, Give Thanks for Everything. There is another absolute. Every person here is anxious. You heard that at the table. And we all need help. But there's the good news, right? There's the good news that we know in our churches that is repeatedly preached and ministered and comforted to us. And that is that Jesus and his word can help us. So I want to invite you to turn with me. If you have your copy of God's word, I hope that you do to just a couple of verses in Philippians chapter four that we want to kind of work from as we're thinking about anxiety and how we may take some of these steps to overcome it. And that's Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. I want to read these couple of verses here, and then we can take that first step off the elevator into the top floor of kind of entering into our anxious reality and get a little sense, get some some hands on what exactly are we talking about in this problem that we're all facing. This is what Philippians chapter 4 says. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. So here we go first. And in fact, you may, if you're taking some notes, I like things that I can hold on to. And so the three levels of our building are easy to remember with just three words. Enter, understand, bring. And again, those are the three things that we want to grow at doing for ourselves and for the people that we love. It's wonderful to hear so many people talk about, you know, I I love someone who's struggling and I want to be able to help them. I also am struggling and I need help. So enter, understand, bring. So we'll begin here on this first level with enter into our anxious reality. Something that all of us, I think, need help to do. Because one of the things you might have noticed when you had that table time is we might not be as good at talking about these struggles as we thought we were. Sometimes it's easy for us to take for granted what anxiety means, how it affects me, um, where my fears come from, what's going on, why, why is the world this way, and why is it affecting me this way? But when we are kind of pushed on it, and we have an opportunity to talk it out, you, like me, probably find that you don't have all the words you thought you did. You don't have it quite all boxed in as a nice category of, well, this is what anxiety is, here's what the Bible says, here's how you deal with it, We have fuzzy, loose senses of that. So what can help us is to kind of get some bearings about this. And let's do it this way. Let's think first about the vocabulary of anxiety. It can be helpful for us to begin 
by thinking about our own vocabulary, the kind of words that we use when we talk about in just daily life as people in the world. When we think about anxiety or we may share with somebody else the way that we're feeling, and some of those English words are, are really obvious to us. Think about these as I read them and think about how you tend to use them or what kind of thoughts they bring to mind for you. When we think about fear or anxiety, we think about these words. Yes, fear. Fear. I am afraid. Anxiety or anxious. We will say that to someone. Would you pray for me or could you help me or this is getting ready to happen. The championship game is tonight and I am feeling anxious. How about the word concern? There's another term that sometimes runs in this family of fear and anxiety. I am concerned about my children. I'm concerned about my life, where it's going. Or I'm concerned about my, my health and, and whether I'm, I'm okay right now. Or care. There's another word. I feel as though my life is full of cares. And not necessarily in the good way. It's good to care. It's good to care about other people. But sometimes when I use that word, it's a darker word. I'm full of cares. My soul is just entangled in the cares of the world or of my life. How about this word? How about the word trouble? I am really troubled. She, he is really troubled. My child is troubled. And I'm troubled for them. As helpful as it can be to get some of those words in our minds, of course, we also know that there's a more important word given to us in the Word of God. And that's where we can go to find God's sort of categories of the, the words that the Bible uses. And that could be a helpful next step for us. And you should be able to see that on the screen. I think my vision is, is not good at a distance, so I can't see what's there. So I'm going to trust that you, you can but let's think for a moment about some biblical words. I've provided those on the screen, and they do fall into similar kind of categories, but it, it may also give us a sense of the way the Bible talks about this. This is very encouraging to me. What would be discouraging to me is if we had a problem like anxiety, and we went to the Bible, and we just couldn't find it talking about that. It would be as if it doesn't exist. But in fact, when we go to the Bible, we find that the Bible talks over and over and over again about these things. That's a huge encouragement to me. That tells me that God understands. That tells me that what I'm going through is, is real. It's important. And it gives me the encouragement of knowing that God's word can help me. God's word is in tune. The Bible uses a couple of words in Hebrew and Greek. I've pointed out there, if you're taking notes, there's some passages that you may, you may look up to continue thinking about this. Uh, maybe, maybe later tonight when you go home or, or even after our weekend is over. The Bible certainly does use the word fear. The Greek word phobio is probably one that sounds really familiar to us because of having a phobia. This word, as the Bible uses it, really refers to a feeling of dread. Now, again, one of the things I think is going to help us at this top level of the building is to slow down and to kind of think about what these things mean. It's easy to just brush right over the words. They're kind of familiar to us. But let's think for a minute. When the Bible talks about fear, it often is referring to a feeling of dread. My wife really, really struggled with anxiety before we came to Open Door in Southeastern. She had a long history of anxiety and, in fact, hospitalizations and, uh, and in fact, along with depression, in, received electroconvulsive therapy at one point when we just didn't know what else to do. And one of the things that she struggled with was an overwhelming, internal, deathly sense of dread. And it can happen at any moment. It can happen sitting, watching a TV show. It can happen just in class. It could happen anywhere. And for many years, that feeling of dread and fear would be so overwhelming that it would totally debilitate her ability to think about life. Now, thankfully... Careful biblical counseling, a healthy local church was really instrumental in helping us with this. But this is where our experience with anxiety comes into clearer light as we get a sense of some of these words. 
a feeling of dread or an apprehension in the face of danger or uncertainty or some perceived threat. Another way that the Bible talks about our anxious condition is using that word that we mentioned earlier in English, which is the word trouble or distress. The Bible talks about being in a state of difficulty, facing some kind of hardship. Think for a moment, slow down, think about your anxieties. Take a little inventory in your heart and mind, even in this moment. Your, your mind is actively engaging with the things we're seeing and thinking about, and images are coming to your mind. When I say those words, hardship and adversity, your heart is speaking to you about that. You are immediately thinking of things going on in your life right now that are difficult. They are adverse. They're hard. And often these things come with this overwhelming, as they did for my wife, and sometimes they do for me now, this overwhelming kind of power of controlling my heart and mind, as it seems. Another way the Bible talks about anxiety is actually to direct it again into our hearts, but around the idea of doubt and unbelief. Now, for those of us who are Christians in this room, we certainly have belief. God, in his sovereign grace, has gifted to us belief in Christ. He has implanted in us the seed of the gospel that has awakened us to some, not all, but we're moving into them glories of God and what he's done for us. And yet still there is this unbelief in me. There's still this remaining sin. And so often I find it connected to, to those experiences I'm having of anxiety and fear, even in my daily life. A lack of faith or confidence, which then is kind of spawning in me this uncertainty about God, about, as I said earlier, where, where is my life going? What am I doing? Am, am I on the right track? Am I, am I doing the right things? For some of us, this can become really concerning in a religious sense. In a, there's a word scrupulosity, which is like a, a kind of religious intensity about getting everything right a feeling of overwhelming guilt. Sometimes that's something that we're feeling and it certainly fits in with anxiety. The Bible talks so much about anxiety that it should give us courage and help and that's what we're about tonight and this weekend. Let's look again at Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 because we actually have, at least in the version that I read and perhaps in the one that you have, if not, it's very close, is this word anxious. Here's another category, though, that what I want to do is focus in on one of the particular words the Bible uses, especially the Greek word that's translated here, anxious. Remember these words again from Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, the word that's used here is interesting because it's the Greek word merimnao or merimna. And what's interesting about this word is it doesn't simply mean anxiety. It's actually a word that has two meanings. <clears throat> and the meaning that's being used is determined by the context. And when we think about this, we think about it in two ways. Sometimes this word, as it comes up in Philippians 4, as, an, as anxious, sometimes it means worried, and sometimes it means concerned. Now, there's a big difference between those two. And it can help us, again, as we're trying to get our mind around some of the grammar of the Bible, which is the grammar of our lives, of what is the difference between these two. So from here, let's just focus in on that word, marimna, or merimnao, and think in those two categories. As we come away from this session, this is one of the big kind of pegs on the wall that we're going to hang what we're considering together. Let's come away with these two. I want you to think in those two terms of concern and worry. As you kind of examine things that are going on in your heart, the kind of troubles that you've brought into the room, some of the things that are coming to your mind in and out as we're talking about this problem, even some of the things you've shared at the table. Let's think in these two ways, concern and worry. It depends upon the context in Scripture of what's going on, whether it is a concern which can be which certainly can be godly, or whether it is worry, which certainly is sinful. 
when we think about concern or care, this is different than worrying. It involves a sense of being concerned, perhaps even preoccupied with something important, but not to the degree that it is pulling me away from the Lord or it's overwhelming me the way that often worry does. But of course, the second way that this word is used is the word for worry. It is the word for anxiety. And it involves being troubled to another degree. This is what makes this so difficult. Because in my life, I find myself teetering back and forth across a line between being concerned and being worried. Between having cares and having anxiety. But the more that I can be a good student of my own heart, and the more that I can be a good student of God's word, I think that there's a lot of help for us to get a grip toward overcoming anxiety and fear. So let's use this as kind of a a simplified mental outlook or grid, even as we leave here, and as we go back into kind of working through the different anxieties that we're facing in life, worry versus concern. Here are three ways that we can do this, okay? So here's the first sort of practical, sort of practical tool. is just a way for us to examine the anxiety that we're facing and to get a sense of on which side of that line is it falling. Is this a concern? We have to be honest about that, right? Because we all know that worry is not good, it's sinful, and it's easy for us to kind of fudge over and say, oh, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about whether Josiah is going to make the shot. I'm just concerned. Well, I went home and went for 45 minutes. I was worried, very worried, and it captivated my attention. So let's, let's think about this three ways. First, if you're trying to discern the difference between the two, focus on control. One, worry often arises both in our own experience of it and in God's word from a desire to control the outcomes or circumstances of life which are in fact outside of my control. That's one big distinction. Think about control. And that's different from concern because when we're concerned, both in our experience and in God's word, Concern acknowledges something that worry doesn't. It acknowledges our own limitations. And it relies and trusts in ultimately God's sovereignty. That's a big difference. You see, it's a big question of control. When I am worried, I am on a sovereignty path. I am seeking out even in feeble ways, even to my own frustration, how can I control the situation? And you can hear it in there. You can hear my unbelief rising up. You can hear my loss of trust because ultimately when I slip over into worry and I want to control my life, there is an ugly unbelief there. There is a sense in which I, I don't trust you, God. You, you, you are not fit to control my life. I am fit to control my life, and therefore, I am going to seek every way that I can ensure that what I want is coming to fruition. So that's one. Focus on control to recognize the difference. Number two, we can pay attention to the effect that this experience or this trouble is having on us both. It could be mentally, one way to think about it, and of course, spiritually. We know those are those are, those are really one and the same. There are, of course, some, some nuances there, but they're one and the same when the Bible talks about our, our mind or our hearts. But this is one way to take a helpful inventory in the midst of anxiety or when trying, we're trying to overcome something. What is the effect this is having on me, especially my spiritual health or my focus? Worry, as we all know, tends to lead to this downward spiral. Because I I can't control the situation I want to control. I feel that I'm all alone. It's slipping further and further away from me. And I'm going down, down, down. We all know, I, I think we all know that. We all know the experience of worry. It is not an upward spiral. It's a downward spiral. And often out of control into some of those other words that we haven't mentioned. Panic. 
is a, is a key word for us. But on the other hand, concern or care in the biblical godly sense in which I'm trusting in God's sovereignty, I am not aloof to the, my life or to the problems in the world. I am concerned and I care about them. But you know there's a big difference there. When I care and am concerned about them in this godly way, it is with a, a hearty trust in God. And it changes the way that I think about my world. It actually helps me to take productive action on an upward spiral toward him, still taking action under my, the responsibility that I have, that we have, but without that downward spiral. And then finally, number three, we may ask this question in the moment that we're trying to discern where am I in this anxiety, fear, concern, care uh, kind of line. And that is, what is the state of my trust in God at this moment? We might need to think about it on a scale. That can be helpful. How would you rate? Think for a moment right now. Take some of those pictures, maybe one. One of those pictures that's come to mind, it's a trouble for you. There's something that's captivating your attention. There's a big temptation to worry. You're right on the line. Think about on a scale, where would you say you are right now in trusting God in the midst of it? On one end, there's the ultimate kind of trust, the best kind of trust that maybe we can experience in this life. And on the other side, there is that complete lack of trust, that sense that I'm all alone, I'm in charge. I have to make sure that things work out. I've got to make sure that my kids turn out right because the Lord is certainly not going to do it because look at where they are now. Look at the way they're disobeying me now. Look at the way what I have been praying for is not being realized. You see, that's very real. That's very real. So we want to think about the difference between our trust in God in those moments. Before we get back in the elevator and we go down a floor and drill a little further into this issue, let's think about a kind of storyline or vignette, okay? And what I want you to do is just in your mind, I want you to hear me tell you a story about two people. There's worried Wendy and there is concerned Chris. And I want you, whether you close your eyes or not, that's up to you. I want you to think about them and I want you to enter into their world as I describe it and get a sense of what they're going through and what the differences are on each side of the line. And perhaps that may shed some light on our hearts as well. So I'll put it to you this way. Worried Wendy and concerned Chris are students. They're both preparing for an upcoming exam. And as the exam date approaches, they both feel a sense of unease about how they're going to perform on the exam. Wendy, who is worried Wendy, she lives kind of consistently in this realm of worry on this worried side of the line, the anxious side of the line. Chris, though, he lives on the other side in the realm of concern, at least when it comes to this exam. And of course, we know they can flip-flop. There's no reason that, that, that Wendy is worried And, you know, the Chris's of the world all have everything under control. They don't. Wendy can be concerned and Chris can be worried too. Worried Wendy spends her days consumed by anxious thoughts about this exam. She constantly frets about failing the exam, losing sleep over these imagined scenarios of embarrassment when when grades are finally posted or she she has to tell her parents how she did on the exam. And she has these, iman- these imaginations of, of deep disappointment. Wendy's worry, because of the downward spiral, actually prevents her from focusing on studying well. It, it certainly is not working to her advantage. It's actually handicapping her ability to perform well or to fulfill her responsibility. And Wendy's worry also is now spreading to her interactions with other people. We know how this is. In those moments of anxiety, I am not, I'm not an enjoyable person to be around. I'm snarky, snap at people, I'm impatient with people, right? Concerned Chris, on the other hand, acknowledges the importance of the exam, 
but he is staying in this place of a kind of God-dependent concern. He spends dedicated time studying and making use of, of his study techniques that he's learned. He is maintaining his responsibility. He's seeking help when he needs it. And Chris knows that while he can prepare to the best of his ability, ultimately, ultimately, the outcome is not entirely within his control. So instead of dwelling on the worst case scenarios, Chris is channeling his concern into this God-dependent constructive action about the trouble that he's facing or this, this exam that he's facing. So he sets realistic goals. He breaks down all of his study time. And as the exam day arrives, what do you think Wendy is like? Bundle of nerves. Her hands are trembling as she sits down to take the test. And despite all of her frantic efforts to control her performance in the exam, her worry has actually sabotaged her. And she's now struggling, exhausted to recall even basic information. Chris, on the other hand, enters the exam room. He's calm. He's trusting in the Lord, trusting in his preparation. And after the exam, Wendy is distraught. She's convinced that her worries were justified. She feels that she failed the test. Chris, however, he is at peace. He is grateful for the Lord's help, and he is entrusted to the Lord. Those are two very different pictures. And every person in this room is at one time Wendy or Chris. We go back and forth. But the beautiful thing that we have in a weekend like this is we have a vision. We have a vision of what would it be like if I, who am often like Wendy, could move even just a few steps in the direction of Chris, wouldn't it be nice? Think about the trouble that comes to your mind. Wouldn't it be nice if you could make some extra progress here in this area such that when these issues enter your life, you are more ready. Your heart is more accepting of the trouble and submissive to the Lord because he's been good to you and you trust him. Wouldn't that be nice? It would be nice. That's what we want. That's what we want to see in a weekend like this. Now, what we need to do is we need to get back in the elevator and we need to go down a floor so that we can understand a little better this anxious world and our place in it. So we've got kind of the grammar of anxiety a little better in our hands. And now let's think about the way that we interact with this problem, in particular, to understand our world. There's an image that's been helpful to me in my life, and I want to give it to you, to think about the troubling experiences or circumstances of life that are connected to those images that came to your heart and mind as we've been talking about this, to think about them as though they are represented by the sun. And the sun is hot in the summer, it's oppressive. It provides a kind of pressure upon us. And so as we think about this anxious world that we live in that is full of trouble, the world, the flesh, and the devil are ever a trio of trouble in our lives, that these experiences only present a kind of occasion, a situation when we will glorify God or we will run into our anxious, worried hearts. The heat is an occasion. Another word we could use is a, a provocation. What I'm wanting you to do is to draw a distinction between the anxiety of your heart and the circumstances of your life. The reason for this is because it's easy for me in the moment of anxiety to point to you, another person outside of me, or to an experience that I'm having and say, that's the real problem. The real problem is that my finances are not in order. And therefore, that's why I am worried. But really, that's not true if you think about it. Because it's not my finances or my family or Josiah's success or failure to hit a shot in a basketball game is not in control of my anxiety. But nevertheless... It is an occasion. It's something for me to be aware of. Let's think of it this way. 
it was put to me in, in really helpful terms, and we'll put it this way tonight. We might think of this heat, this occasion for either glorifying God or, or perhaps turning away from him in anxiety and worry, that we may think of them as five different kinds of heat. Let's just do it this way. We'll think about what big five categories are there of situations in life in which we tend to find ourselves tempted to anxiety. The first, we might say, are kind of general life hardships. This is why anxiety seems to be a kind of low-grade fever in my life. Kind of all the time, there's this underlying murmur of anxiety in my heart. And in my life, it's because my life is full of general life hardships. It's just the ordinary daily difficulties of life. That's certainly a part of our lives. Another kind of heat or, or pressure that is applied to our lives can, for some of us, be body problems. We are body and soul, and, and sometimes our bodies are not as, as, as fit as they need to be. Sometimes we're, we're sick. Sometimes we go through a, a, a temporary uh, time of, of illness or weakness and tiredness, and certainly that affects us. There are also, there's also a category of heat that is when someone sins against me. This is when I have a conflict with another person and, and that's presented this occasion for me to bear good fruit through godly concern, yet trusting God and working, moving forward, or to bear bad fruit. Of course, some of this is, is also provoked in us because we've had some examples set for us. It could be by our parents. It could be by someone else in, uh, in our lives, some some, yeah, it could be some teacher, it could be some pastor in the past that just gave me some bad advice about my anxiety. That can make it worse as well, can it? That's an occasion. And then, of course, the fifth would be, would be the devil. We have an enemy. We have an enemy that would like for us to turn away from our God. We have an enemy that would like for us to be worried and seek our own control rather than trusting in his loving sovereignty, rather than depending upon his grace. But all of these are merely occasions. We're going to put a cultural word on it because I think that will help. All of these are stressors. That's a familiar word to us, right? How many times do you say, I'm really stressed? What do you mean? What do you mean by that? What we should mean by that is simply this. I'm recognizing that there is heat in my life. There is stress being applied to my life. That image of the sun, that's helpful. I, I do feel the stress of the sun in the summer when it's really hot, and I feel that in my life. Or you might think of stress another way, uh, like a stress test. If you were to go to the doctor to check out your heart, sometimes you're, you're given a stress test. Maybe chemically you're on a treadmill. Stress is applied to your heart to see how it responds. That's another good picture when we think about stress. Or we might think about it as what engineers do when they build a bridge. They put that bridge under stress to see how it's going to respond. This is an important distinction because if I'm not clear in my own heart and mind about the dynamics, at least these two big ones, my heart and my circumstances, I will mix them up and I won't be able to apply the biblical tools God has given to me because I'll be confused. I will be thinking that my problem of anxiety is outside of me when in fact it is inside of me. The things that are going on outside of me are important. They are important. They are powerful, but they're not ultimate. And therefore, we need to think about this in this careful way. That's why not only should we try to understand our world, take inventory of the stressors in my life. We're going to talk practically about that at least to some degree at the end of our time, but to think carefully about our world and also be able to think carefully about ourselves. This is where we're going to think about our hearts. Now you hear this in, at Open Door, you hear this in our church a lot, so it should be somewhat familiar. If it's not, and this is the first time you're kind of hearing about it, this will be a helpful, um, uh, a helpful truth for you. We're reminded in the Word of God that our hearts are a kind of command center of our lives. Now, tonight, what I want to do, keeping things simple, is for us to, when you think about your heart, just think about two big things. Think about what you believe 
and think about what you desire. These are the two dynamics inside my heart that are most at work in my anxious moments, what I believe and what I desire. I have rogue beliefs that have departed from what God says is true. And they're in my heart and I, I, I go back to them over and over again. And those are probably the ones that the part of our heart that we're a little more familiar with. We, we might be able to get our hands around that a little easier than we can that other part, which are desire. So what I want to do in the next couple moments is let's just think a little more carefully about desires. It is certainly true. We need to be aware of what we believe. That's the, that's the great value of, of biblical community in our churches so that we can hear truth. We have the word of God preached to us and we have good counsel around us to help us think about what we believe and to exchange those rogue beliefs for, for truths. But here's the other part that's, that's probably most helpful to us because it's most, I think, most difficult. And that is getting our, our minds and hearts around what we want. Because that really is at the heart of anxiety, our desires. Because our desires, often for good things, I want Josiah to hit the shot. That's a good thing. Becomes ruling. It becomes controlling. And it's captivated my attention. I could not think of anything else that night when that was going on. After it was over, I... I, I was supposed to keep the book for the next game. I was in another universe. I just kept replaying that failure over and over again. It captivated me because I wanted it so badly. There is a helpful image that uh, you'll be able to see on the screen. And we certainly can continue to, you know, uh, work it out in our, in our hearts and minds after we know about it. But you can just think about this, your heart as uh, sitting at the top of a staircase, and that at the top of the staircase is the throne of your heart. And that's as a Christian where, where Christ is. He is ruling my heart at the top of the staircase. But you'll notice on the screen, on the, on the, uh, on the di- little diagram there, that there are all these little desires at the bottom of the staircase. And what tends to happen is those good desires leave the submission, place of submission at the bottom of the staircase, submitting to Christ who is ruling my heart, and they get bigger and they start to ascend the throne. When you think about those images of of anxious moments, the things that you're really worried about, you have to ask this question. What do I want? What is the ruling desire of my heart in the midst of my worry? This is what we have to get our hands around because this is what is so central to anxiety and worry. And this, therefore, is the key to overcoming it. We need God's help in order to see the ruling desires of my life be submitted back under the loving, sovereign control of Christ who reigns on on the throne of my heart so that I can submit to him, be useful to him, and to enjoy him. As we do this, there are some questions that we can ask ourselves, even in these moments, I found these very helpful, even in the midst of moments of anxiety, if they're not too overwhelming, you know, they're in the middle somewhere, to try to get a sense of whether my desires have become ruling. Here's the first. Does this desire consume me? Is it something that has become so consuming that even functionally in this moment, Jesus is not the ruler of my heart? It doesn't mean I'm not a Christian. It doesn't mean he's left me. He's never going to leave me. He's chosen to save me. He's going to keep me forever. But in this moment, this desire is in control. Does it consume me? And number two, here's another good question. Do I sin in order to get this thing that I want? This desire that's at the heart of my anxiety or at the heart of what my worry that's led me into controlling and white-knuckling the situation of my life, am I willing to sin in order to get it? Am I willing to leave God, orchestrate my own life, leave his plans behind, craft my own? That's a good sign that this is a desire that's captivating me and it is running the show at the heart of my anxiety. And then the third is, do I sin when I don't get it? Whenever this thing that I have set my heart upon does not come to fruition, what is my response? 
So these are two ways, briefly, those two ways that we should be thinking to understand our world, the circumstances of life, the things that are going on, keeping them in proper perspective. They're not controlling me, but they're important. And thinking about what's going on in my heart. Those are some simple questions we can ask. And of course, none of us walk out of here masters at this. It will come by practice. And so perhaps one of those questions, perhaps even this concept that ultimately my worry and anxiety is driven by, in large part, things that I want and want too much, even if they're good things, may be helpful to us. So we want to understand the anxious world and our place in it. And now we need to go back down in the, in the moments that we have left one more floor and try to bring some answers to this, to this anxiety. We want to bring Christ himself and his answers to bear upon this problem. Look again at Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, this is what I love about God's word. God's word does not simply throw law at me. It doesn't simply, well, it wasn't in the Bob Newhart show. There was an episode where he was telling somebody, just stop it. Stop. The Bible doesn't just say stop it. The Bible says, do not be anxious about anything, but, and then gives me answers. Listen to these answers and then let's work through uh, some, some helps as we bring this, this time to a close. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. Now, we thought about understanding our world. And we thought about understanding ourselves. Let's now take that next word, bring. Okay, enter, understand, bring. Bring, and let's bring answers to both of those. At least a few. First, what's most important, if I'm going to overcome or gain some victory over anxiety and fear, I need to bring answers to my heart. I need my heart to be changed, first and foremost. We'll get to our world in a minute. I do need to make changes in my world but the heart is the most important. I need to capture these rogue beliefs and I do need to treat them with truth. I need help. I might need a biblical counselor. I might need to spend some time with my care group leader or a trusted friend. Help me work through what's going on. I am overwhelmed by anxiety and I feel as though my beliefs are kind of spinning out of control away from God's word. Can you help me rein them back in? That, of course, comes through meditating on God's word. Now, this is one of those things where I have to stop myself because I take that for granted. I think that I know what that means. It's another one of those things. You start quizzing me on what does it mean to meditate on God's word. I'm not quite as good at explaining it as I think I am. You probably aren't either. So let's not take that for granted. What do we mean when we say meditate on God's word? We mean that we're going to capture the truth of God's word And we're going to hold it in our minds while we turn it over. You might think about taking some kind of treasure. Uh, It could be a, uh, a painting. It could be a gem. And you take this and you fixate your attention on it, turning it over, looking at it from every angle. This essentially is what the Bible means when it tells us to meditate upon the word of God. It doesn't simply mean, you know, kind of like think about the words. And like, just kind of read them as you're driving your car. That's great. It's really good. But that's not meditating. Meditating is to take the truth that I need and to fix it in my mind and hold it there while I turn it and see how I need it to change me. To take it and actually map that truth onto or map a promise onto this anxious place in my life. This is one key way, dealing with our beliefs, that we need to change our hearts. Here's the second, is to recognize these ruling desires, which we discussed a moment ago, and submit them to Christ. To recognize when this this desire for something, some outcome in my life has captivated my attention. It's driving along my internal dialogue with myself or maybe even with God if if I am prayerful about this. Perhaps I'm considering sinning and taking control of my life. I'm going to take the wheel to recognize this and then to fight against these ruling desires. Ken Sandy, 
who is has been a helpful voice in dealing with this idolatry, which is what the Bible calls it, provides us with a, a helpful kind of four-part plan. It's easy to remember. Again, that's the kind of thing that I need help with and that helps me most. And here they are, four R's. You could write this down if you're taking notes. These are easy to understand. How do we deal with ruling desires? One, first, recognize them. Two, there's always going to be a need for our repentance. It means that I'm going to turn back to God with the hope and understanding that he has already offered me grace. I am not coming to my, someone who is secretly my enemy. I'm coming to someone who loves me and welcomes me. I'm going to repent and then I need help. I have to refocus my heart and I have to see these desires replaced. Again, this is the process of seeing those ruling desires go back down the staircase into their proper place where Christ is on the throne. I need my heart to change. If you take nothing else away from the 45 minutes or so that we've been talking, take that away. Ask God, how can I change my heart? You change my heart. Show me where my desires are and what is at the heart of my dread, my fear. Why am I afraid? There is something that I want. Men, in the men's breakout tomorrow, we're going to talk about that very thing. The fact that your fear is a desire, a ruling desire, turned on its head. Every fear is that way. Every fear exists because there's something that I want, and I'm not really sure that I'm going to get it. So that's a helpful picture there for us as we want to see our hearts changed. But also we mentioned, here's some practical suggestions to us that have been helpful to me and others we do also need to consider how we can change our world. There is nothing wrong with considering maybe there is something in my life that needs to change, something outside of me. It could be a circumstance, an occasion where my anxiety is starting to kind of run wild. Let's think about this a little bit in practical terms. This certainly is not everything, but I'm speaking to you as someone who needs this help and sharing with you where I have found it and what has been problematic for me. And maybe, maybe it will resonate with you. Noise. My life is full of noise. My world is full of noise. So is yours. Listen, I have, I have like so many people come to a place in my just daily digital life where I have a million inputs all the time, raising questions, telling me things, distracting me, pulling me this way, pulling me that way. This is what my world is like and I need my world to change. Perhaps you do too. So I want to suggest some ways that you can help this. This It might not be exact things that you would do, but at least they'll give you a, maybe a trajectory to think about some things that need to change in your world. For most of us, and I know that it's, it's easy to kind of set this up and knock it down, but it is important, is, is our relationship to technology. I, that's like, oh, is he, are you 85? Are you up here? Like you're out of touch. You don't know. You don't have a cell phone. You don't have, I do. I have an iPhone. I have a smartphone. I love the internet. It's one of my favorite places to be, but it is a problem for me because it is a major source of noise for me. I need to change my relationship with this. You might be thinking about kids. You might be thinking about your own life, your relationship to social media. And please, I know that sounds like a played out thing that, that we, we, we poo-poo social media all the time. Social media can be a wonderful thing. But for me and likely for you, it has become something of a major distraction and honestly a source of anxiety. It is providing a kind of stress and it is charging me mental overhead that I'm not able to give to my spiritual life because of the scrolling or because of all the different voices that are coming in and out. So I want to make some suggestions because this is a big thing for most people. One, remove social media from your phone. Look at it only on your computer. Log in and look at it, not on your phone. Think about this. Think about, look around. How many people have their phone on the table? I, I, I do too. It's always with us and it's always, it's always pumping in. I have found 
in the last six months, enormous help by silencing that a little bit. I've silenced some of the the ongoing input of my life through email. Some of you have a relentless flow of email into your inbox and it is overwhelming you. Some of that has to change. I, in fact, also put, turned my phone on do not disturb recently. And actually, if you have an iPhone, you can go in and, and put setting, settings in there that only certain people, their messages can come through to you in a notification or their calls. And others can wait until you can come and deal with them so that it's not this constant ding, 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 ding. That was a big part of, of some struggles that I was having because it was just in the midst of all of the others, another way that my, my energy was being taken, my focus was being captured. And in fact, I needed my phone to be less interesting. My wife was really happy about that because she was always, you're always on that phone, man. Put that phone, it's dinner time. Put that phone down. So I needed to make it less interesting. And so I made my phone black and white. There's no color on it. The screen is all black and white. And I'm not that interested looking at it anymore. Those are just some kinds of things that we can do when we find ways uh, or areas of our lives where there's just a lot of noise. I also have found some help by changing my relationship to the news. We were talking about this last night a little bit. I've been experimenting for a few months at least with getting my news mostly from people who are alive in front of me rather than having the news constantly on. I don't know if you recognize it, how much of an impact that has on just daily life to constantly be hearing about everything going on in the world. We're in an interesting time when you can know about everything in every corner of the world every day. What is wrong with that? What is wrong with having that? constant input what's wrong with that is i'm just a creature i'm not sovereign this desire for me to have all of the input see all of the posts get all the stories know all the details all of the events is me trending towards sovereignty i want to know i need to know everything and i'm just not fit for that that's the that's, a, that's the creator-creature distinction. I am not the creator. And therefore, I need to tone this down. It could be that you need to tone it down as well. These are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about in our worlds. Now, also, there are relationships that we need to address. There's peacemaking that needs to be done. Of course, all of those are important aspects of life. I'm trying to draw attention to some that are maybe not quite so obvious to us. And then finally, as we bring this session to a close, let's notice this very clear insistence in Philippians on gratitude, on thanksgiving. This is what is so often lost for me in my moments of anxiety and worry. I have lost a sense of God's goodness to me, and I have lost a heart of gratitude. So we can then, as the scriptures do, insist on this in our lives as a kind of weapon against fear and anxiety. To lower fear and anxiety, we need to turn up the gratitude. Find ways that we can, you'll see on the screen, in conversation with God, fill more of my prayer time with gratitude. Finding things in my life that I can be uniquely thankful for. You could have a journal and call it a providence journal. What if you did that? Imagine. What if you spent a little time every day and you started with your earliest recollection of your life and you started writing down every providence of God in your life? Everything you think of. You've forgotten half of them, but the ones that you can remember, start writing them down, writing them down, writing them down, and work your way as far as you can remember, year by year, where you lived, who was around, what did God do, what did he bring you through, how did he help you, how did he, how did he save you, all those things to fuel our gratitude. But not only in conversation with God, in conversation with ourselves. How often do you talk to yourself? You talk to yourself like I do. You talk to yourself about your worries a lot, right? I talk to myself about the worries and the anxieties all day long. But how often do I talk to myself with God's help about all that he is doing for me and how and why I can trust him? 
And then finally, certainly in conversation with others, because this is a community effort, and that's why it's great to be in a healthy local church, where we care about these things, we're willing to have weekend workshops, and we're willing to move forward together from here. And in those conversations, not only thinking about your own anxiety, but you know you're in a room full of anxious people, right? So let's think a little more then. What can I do to put you at ease? Every person in this room is in need of more people who present a non-anxious presence. That's one reason among millions that you should be thankful for your pastors, in particular, Pastor Dwayne. I don't know. I don't know anybody in my life who has exemplified a non-anxious presence more. And that's been a big help to me. It's a help to you. How can you be that non-anxious presence to someone else? And then finally, we have this great hope as we come to this conclusion, a bright, hopeful result. As we listen to God's word and with his help, we take these actions. Notice this at the end. Notice the promise, the peace of God. Do you need peace? Do you feel that right now? I know that some of us are really feeling it. Do you need peace in this moment? God offers us peace through our thanksgiving, through making our requests known to God, known to him, which is our submission to him. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. This is not an earthly kind of peace. It's not in this world. It's not of this world. It's alien peace. It's of another world. It's beyond anything that I could even understand. And it will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that. And then I want to pray and ask God to help us. What are the two things that God is offering to us in this gospel-centered action with his help against uh, fear and anxiety? He's offering us peace and he's offering us safety. Those are the two things that I'm trying to get with all of my worry and anxiety. They're the two things that my heart is just wired for and he is offering them to me in this better way. Let's pray as we transition to the last part of our evening uh, to be able to talk together a little bit about some of these things. And let's ask God to help us because we certainly need his help. Father, we come before you, I hope, with a greater sense of humility, a greater sense of our need. Perhaps, uh, Perhaps for some, we didn't realize that this was such an issue, but as we talked about it, it became more clear to us in our own hearts that we are anxious, that we are worried, that it is not pleasing to you. It's not honoring to Christ, and it certainly is not good for us. And so we pray that you would take these truths that we've seen just these few moments. As we pray that you would plant them in our hearts and that you would uh, bear fruit from them, that they would be seeds that would grow, they wouldn't fall to the ground. And we pray that by your grace, you would help us in our churches to care for one another. And even as the rest of our workshop continues this weekend, that you would give us additional help and additional tools and truth so that we may turn to you and that we may glorify you and enjoy you day by day. We know that this is, this is really what we're losing in our fear and anxiety. We are losing, in a sense, you. And we pray that you would help us to regain to regain our commitment to you and our enjoyment of you as a result of your goodness to us uh, in this hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.